Hey, church, good morning. How you doing? Welcome. Glad that you are here. We're talking about prayer in this new year, 2023. Anybody still writing the last year on checks and stuff? I wrote like 2018 on a check last year. And I was just like, wow, way off. Way off. Not even close. Um, <laughs> I think that uh, prayer is um, uh, something that certainly gets ignored, but probably more so it is something that some Christians practice constantly, and other Christians maybe just miss it a pinch and miss um, the relational aspect of what it means to pray to God every day. And I was reading this book. Um, it's called Help Thanks Wow by Anne Lamott. Her prose is amazing. It's a beautiful book. And the idea of it is um, three one-word prayers that you can pray. Like, you don't have to, like, go to a cathedral, kneel down, hold your hands like this, you know, because if you do it like this, it doesn't count. You can, you can say to God when you're driving, like, help. Like, I feel out to sea in my emotions. I, I genuinely need help. And God really actually functionally hears you and responds to those things because he loves you and he cares about you, you know? And then you could say, thanks, God. Or, wow, you know, the, the, the Owen Wilson of prayers. Wow. Um, <laughs> and... <laughs> That's like, the, that's like the Arizona sunset prayer, you know, like, wow, this is beautiful. And my uh, wife and I have a friend named Diana. She added a fourth one to this, and, and her fourth one-word prayer is ouch, ouch. And I, I like that a lot. I pray that to God all the time, like, ow, that, ugh, didn't like that. And the idea that God is always with you and that you are your life is lived with God and that you don't have to like start and stop praying. You are just praying. God already hears the things you're saying anyway, you know. And these quick ones are like quick little texts that you would have in any relationship, you know. Like if you have a good friend, I'm sure you text. My wife and I text each other memes all the time. Our meme thread absolutely rips and they're amazing, and the dankest of all memes. And if that was all that your relationship was, was just memes, that would be cool. That would be like kind of like a casual friendship, right? But, but it has to have this other functional part, which is longer, more structured conversations. And so I wonder sometimes if Christians are stuck in these like micro prayers and they've never prayed for a long time, never had an hour, say, of prayer. And I just wonder what would happen for people if they did something like that. And I want to teach you how to do that today. But if an hour sounds like a long time, don't worry. Any of the things I'm going to teach you today could be integrated into a 30-minute, 20-minute, 10-minute I think you should pray the longest prayer you've ever prayed this week. And I think that something cool will happen. This is what we're talking about. What if you prayed about it this whole year? What would happen if you prayed about a thing for a whole year? You know, I already know what would happen. Definitely not nothing is, is the answer of, of what would happen. Jesus talked about prayer for an hour as, a, as a, a metric of certainly something when he was talking to his disciples. Do you remember this from Matthew chapter 26? He was like about to be taken, crucified. Peter's about to like commit felony assault against the guy's ear. And do you, do you remember this part? And Jesus is like, hey, pray for a few minutes. Just stay with me, watch and pray. It says in Matthew chapter 26, verse 40, he came to the disciples and he found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, so couldn't you watch with me for one hour? This is, this is an extremely common Apostle Peter L. Um, 
Prayer for an hour in Jesus' mind was something that people should be able to do. And then he says that word watch again in verse 41. He says, watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. Watch is an attention word, an attentive attitude toward God. Then he says this, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. That's really something, isn't it? Jesus is saying the spirit, not your spirit, The Spirit of God is capable of, through you, making things happen that you don't think you're functionally able to do. And your body is not capable of making you do things that you think you are capable of doing. And this is why so many Christians are so miserable, because they hear a sermon like this, and they're like, cool, I'm going to go pray for an hour. And the only way of doing something that they have is their body and bones and brain And they're like, this is awful. And you're like, yeah, it's a spiritual thing. But when you learn how to live out what you hear at church in the spirit, you find the spirit of God willing to empower you to do things like wind in sails. And you're like, oh my gosh, I'm like becoming like Jesus. I'm not not doing it, but it's happening through me. And I wonder what would happen if you prayed the longest prayer that you've ever prayed this week, maybe an hour, maybe longer. Some people uh, think that God is a vending machine, um, which means they think that what prayer is, is I'm going to go to God, I'm going to tell God the things that I want, and then he is going to get them for me. He's my galactic sugar daddy. And... We're going to get us some stuff that we need, and that's going to be enough. You know, like, dear God, um, please make me rich. And dear God, please give me the promotion that I don't deserve, have not worked for, and certainly am not being considered for. Um, Dear God, please help my son. You've seen him, God. Guy's a bit of a butthead. Can you help him out? Lord knows I've failed. (laughs) Anyways, amen. Um, Hey, God, can you help my spouse see how much they irritate me? You know? Some people think that God is a vending machine, so they think that functionally what happens is you, like, pick something that you want and you pray for it, and then God just, like, makes it happen, and then you're just like, cool, here's, like, the thing that I wanted or whatever, and that isn't the way that it works at all. This is why prayer is such a mystical, beautiful, strange thing because what people who've endured and endeavored in prayer have found is that you think your prayer is going to change God, but your prayer changes you. And then the things that you want are the things that God wants. That's why God says, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. When your truest desire is for the Lord, you look at everything in life, and you're like, God, can I have that? And he's like, of course. Of course. But then there are other people who are so afraid of God or have a view of God that he is so angry that this makes no sense to them. They don't ever ask God for anything. They don't ask God to bless their marriage. They don't ask God to help their son come back to the Lord. They don't ask God for favor before a meeting. They don't ask God for help before they get into a conflict. They don't ask God for help when they get angry when they're driving. They don't ask God for really that much at all because they view God as some sort of like angry, you know, sky captain and he doesn't have time for me. And they totally miss that God says, ask and you'll receive. Seek and you'll find. Knock and it will be open to you. And in that center right there is the mystery and beauty of what makes prayer so special and integral in the life of a Christian. So I want to talk about what it would look like for you to pray for an hour. Are we ready for that? Can we do that together this morning? So here's what it would look like. First of all, 
If you want to pray for an hour or a half hour, you want to pray the longest prayer you've ever prayed, grab a spot, get your spot, then get rid of your phone. Where's my phone? Okay. Get rid of this. Because the thing that I definitely do when I sit down to pray is I'm like, okay, I'm going to sit down and pray. First, I'm going to read the Bible. I can't find my Bible. I'm going to look at the Bible on my phone. Then I'm like, oh, you know what app looks good? Instagram. And I should respond to some people on Instagram because it's like a nice thing to do because people are asking me Bible questions. I got to be a good pastor. This counts, right? Doesn't this count for prayer? I'm like doing a thing. And so anyways, I get rid of my phone and then I sit down, get a nice, nice chair, you know, get a nice coffee, right? Anybody else? Can't do my Bible study without a good coffee. What am I, a caveman? (laughs) Get my notebook, my pen, get everything else out of the way. Get my Bible, and then I'm like ready to rock. Like I am just like sitting there, and I'm like, man, I am the most, like I am the most righteous person (laughs) of all time. Like, look at this setup. Like, we're going to pray kingdom come right now, and the heaven is going to rip open. Like, Elijah's fire chariot is currently being readied to come bring me to heaven because I am, like, the best Christian of all time. I'm just joking. But a good thing to do before you start uh, praying is this is the first tip. I got five tips for you. First one is to prep and write a list. So one of the things people do in prayer is they think they have to think of everything to pray about, and then they get kind of lost, and then they're thinking, and then they're not praying anymore. So I would encourage you to just write out the things you're going to pray for before you start. So I'm going to pray for my wife. I'm going to pray uh, for these three things that are my prayer requests. I'm going to pray for uh, my, my church request because I've got this, this challenge that is, what if you prayed about it for the whole year? And so I'm going to write that one down. I'm going to pray for that every day. Then I'm going to pray for my kids, and then I'm going to pray for two situations at work, and there's my list. And then we've got our prep all done, and we're ready to pray for an hour or for the longest amount of time that we've ever prayed for. And it's just four sections of 15 minutes. That's it. The first one is thank God gratitude. Thank God gratitude. And if you jump right into prayer and start telling God all the things you want, it's just a bit weird and awkward, and it isn't really functionally the way the Bible teaches us to engage with God. The Bible says, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. The idea in Scripture is that we would present ourselves to God, worshiping him and praising him. Many of the people who I look up to in their prayer, I've noticed, never, ever start praying before they spend a few minutes just worshiping God. Even if they're praying after a service or even if they're praying with a person, they always start that way. And there's something incredibly powerful about this. And there's something... um, Worry dominates many of our lives, and many of us have found the truth that worshiping God overcomes worry. How did, I, how did I write it down? Worship defeats worry. And so sometimes in this section, I will sing to God. I'll put on, like, I got, like, a Spotify playlist of, like, the most lit worship songs, and I'll put that on, and I'll sing, or I will just tell God all of the things that I am thankful for, or I will just praise God. And this is a good thing for your heart. It's a good thing for your life. And you could spend 15 minutes that way, and it would not be a wasted time. And then the second thing is ask God supplication. This is what we were talking about with the vending machine. This is where you go through your list. And so you've got your list all prepped because you're like such a great Christian. You're like ready to rock. And so we're going to just pray straight through the list. So we're going to pray for, I'm going to pray for my wife. I'm going to pray for my church. I'm going to pray for each of my kids. And I'm going to pray for the thing I'm praying for this year. I've got my three prayer requests, and I'm going to pray for this. And that's going to take, you know, 10, 15 minutes once you get your whole list all set up. And then you're going to pray for your pastor, right? Every day for 20 minutes, (laughs) right? For me me and Kevin, right? For both of us. Um, With 10 minutes of gratitude prayer to start. Um, (laughs) So that is the supplication piece, and it seems like very long to some people, but the truth is, is that the more that you, oh, wait, wait, I'm, I'm coming to that later. I can't spoil that yet. All right, the third piece is listen to God, read. So thank God gratitude, ask God supplication, and then listen to God, read. So 
for many people, reading the Bible and prayer in their mind would be two completely separate parts of being a person of faith or a Christian. And that's not true. That's not the way it is in the Bible. They're integrated, and they are all holistic ways that we engage with God. And so when I'm reading my Bible, I am also with God praying, and I recognize and understand that the author of the book is present with me as I read. I'm not reading it to him. I'm reading it with him. And when I'm praying, I'm often praying Scripture out loud. And so they're much more integrated than the average Christian or, or many people really understand who functionally views it like a checklist. So let's pick a passage for our reading time today. So somebody yell it out. What do you want, Old Testament or New Testament? Okay, somebody said Old Testament, so we'll do the Old Testament. And then what do you want, the books of the law, the books of history, the books of wisdom, or the books of prophecy? Which do you want? Wisdom, Wisdom. okay. So we got Job, we got Psalms, we got... This is exactly what they picked in the last service, literally. Don't, don't tell me you're going to pick the same exact one. That would be unbelievable. All right, what, um, there's 150 psalms. Somebody yell out a number. 118. 118 was the first one I heard. All right, so we're going to go to Psalm 118. We would have picked this before. Oh, this is a good one. Okay, so we're going to um, read this in our prayer time with God. So I'm going to say, before I open my Bible, God, I believe that you're with me, and I believe that you speak to me, mostly through your word, and so I'm praying that you would speak to me now. I believe in you, and I pray that you would help me to believe the things that I see here and live them out. So Psalm 118, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, his steadfast love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, his steadfast love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, his steadfast love endures forever. And if you've been functionally taught that the Bible is a book that tells you exclusively what to do before you believe it, then a lot of passages will be really hard for you to read or understand because it isn't just about finding things to do and then doing them. It's about meeting a person who teaches you how to think, believe, and live, and then you live in that way with his spirit. It's quite a bit different. And so when I'm reading scripture, I would encourage you to less think about what do I need to do today. That is important, and Christians must obey the commands of Christ. It's of the utmost importance. But obeying the commands of Christ without believing in the commands of Christ is the easiest way to become a hypocrite. And so first, I'm always thinking, do I believe the thing that's being said? And I got to tell you, a lot of times I read something and I'm like, man, I really don't believe that. And then I stop and I ask God to help me. Verse 5. Out of my distress, I called on the Lord. He answered me and set me free. The Lord is on my side. I won't fear. What can man do to me? And so that's listen to God, read, and then we're going to go right into the fourth and final piece, which is be with God, meditate. Be with God, meditate. And a lot of it, meditate is a hard word for some Christians because it's, they think of like Buddhism or something, and um, they think that it's, you know, Eastern meditation, which is emptying your mind, but it's not. Um, uh, before any of those Eastern religions existed, God wrote the word meditate into the book of Psalms uh, a lot of times um, because meditation is a good practice, and meditation is filling your mind with things. And it's kind of like a click moment when you realize that we all meditate, we all choose to ruminate and think about and remember things. It's really just about picking what you meditate as a person on and choosing to go over a piece of content. And so that is exactly what we're going to do with that verse, because I like that verse. That's one I would meditate on. I really like this one. Verse 6, the Lord is on my side. I won't fear. 
what can man do to me? If I was reading this alone, I would feel guilty about how many fears I have. And I would feel like, man, like I have random fears of people and things and places and things that I perceive might happen to me. And so right now in this moment, I'm going to be with God. I'm going to meditate on this truth. And hopefully I'm going to let go of some of those fears because of the truth of what this says. God is on my side. I won't fear. What can man do to me? And I'm just going to repeat it slowly in my mind for 10, 15 minutes. Do you remember the first time you ever rode in a car with your husband or wife, or if you're unmarried, like your brother or sister or a college roommate? Whenever that happened, you like felt like you had to fill all of the time with talking, right? And then at some point, you became comfortable with silence, right? So at some point, it was the first time ever that you two felt chill to just hang. You didn't have to like agree on a podcast and like discuss it or like talk. You had reached a tier of relationship where you were totally comfortable saying nothing. It's a, it's a really beautiful thing, isn't it? And it's not unlike what meditation is with God. It is recognizing the value of being with him. I'm gonna be with God. Everyone understands the value of being with their kids. Everyone understands the value of being with their extended family. Everyone understands the value of being with friends. But I'm just gonna be with God and this piece of content that he said. That is an extremely powerful thing. And they did a study of nuns in a convent. Some of the nuns did not believe in what is called surrendering or listening prayer, which is what I'm talking about, meditative prayer. Some of the nuns did believe in it. And they did brain scans of all of these people all of these women, and they found that the people that believed and practiced daily meditative prayer had better brain scans on whatever markers it was that they were looking for, which isn't really surprising, is it? Like, it's not surprising that when we do the things that God says to do, that the body that he made works and functions better, right? It's not surprising at all. Like, I, I saw this this atheist guy on uh, the internet a couple weeks ago, and he was like, proof, there is no God. Uh, <laughs> um, when you sing, uh, it stimulates the vagus nerve in the back of your throat, which causes your stomach to feel calm, which causes your brain to feel calm. And all these Christians say they feel calm while they're singing to God. Gotcha. Um, and I just read stuff like that, and I'm like, well, of course. Like, what do you mean? God designed our body. Of course he would design it in such a way that the things he tells us to do are beneficial to us, right? Anybody else? I'm just like, I'm like unconvinced, bro. Also, like, dude, like, look at this sunset, bro. Like, checkmate, you're move atheists. Like, come on. Like... <laughs> I wrote this down, the more you pray, the more you realize you have to pray about. The more you pray, the more you realize you have to pray about. Like, I call my mom on the phone every day because I am the greatest son <laughs> who has ever lived. No, it is because I love my mom and we have a good relationship and we talk about whatever is going on and everything and my kids and whatever is going on in life. Now, juxtapose that with you talking with your college roommate or buddy from 10 years ago or a person you used to work with. When you talk with somebody you haven't talked to in a long time, 
there is an element of weirdness to it because you don't know at what level to talk about things. Like, if it's your college roommate, you used to talk about everything, like cereal and this morning's meeting or test, and, like, you would talk about everything to, like, a tedious level, right? But then you move on and get married or whatever, and, and then you don't talk for a long time, and then you talk, and it's like, well, how do I catch up with someone on, like, 10 years in, like, such a small amount of time? And so you're like, well, you know, uh, I, I got married and had two kids and I got a job and how are things going for you? And you explain 10 years in like 10 seconds. But if you were roommates with that person the entire time, how many hundreds of hours would you have spent explaining all of the details of those exact things? And that's the difference that many people don't understand about prayers, that the more you pray, the more you realize you have to pray about and the more you integrate God into every area of your life, the more you realize, oh, I got to pray to God about this meeting. I don't have to. I want to. I want to talk to God. I want to be with God. I want to have God to understand what's going on in my heart. I want to obey him. I want to pray all of the time. I want to thank him all of the time because it's, it's a part of the way that I live my life. Because the more that I pray, the more I realize that I have to pray about and so I wonder what would happen if you prayed the longest prayer that you've ever prayed this week. And I wonder what would happen if you chose a thing, maybe dusted off an old prayer and prayed it for this year, or maybe picked something new that God has laid on your heart. Um, have you picked out something yet? I I cannot wait to hear and see all that God does through this and through his kids asking him for stuff because he's, he's good. He's, he's good at being God and he's good at bringing good things. And for some reason, he puts this asking in between. I don't know why he does it but that's the way that it is. I wanted to have a conversation about prayer with my friend Kevin. If Kevin could uh, come and join me on stage, wanted to talk a little bit about different elements of prayer that we've seen make a difference in our lives and home. And I didn't tell Kevin I was gonna say this, but I could not find you when we had been working together for like three or four days. And I was like, where is this guy? We gotta get some work done here. And I was walking all around campus, and I couldn't find him. And people were like, yeah, we don't know where he is. And I found him in here um, praying um, for all of you guys. And I thought that was very indicative of something extremely special about him and about this place. Um, what, what prayer practices have you seen have a big impact in your life? Yeah, uh, good question. I, I would start by saying... <clears throat> that I have to admit I'm not, I wasn't good and I'm still not great at prayer. Like, I, but I heard a message in this room about praying without ceasing. Mm -hmm. And um, going on a gratitude hunt was mm -hmm. really the idea. And so about a decade ago, I just decided to try to capture all of the things in my day that I saw that I was like, oh, that's really cool. And mm -hmm. if it's cool, it's probably from God. And so yeah. I want to, like, thank God for that. And so I did it for 45 days straight where I would either... Uh, write it down on my phone or on my office or on a pad of paper, different places. And what I started to see is that there's a theme of gratitude around God's creation. So, for example, um, one of the things I love to do is get up in the morning before the sun comes up and go sit on my back porch on the weekend. I got a fire pit. But um, about, I don't know, last week sometime, this great horned owl <laughs> just comes like silently ninja, like gliding in and lands on a tree. And yeah. He's obviously having breakfast. And I was like, wow, God, that's really cool. And I got to sit there and watch it for about 20 minutes. I took some pictures, showed my kids later, like, check this out. And they weren't impressed by it. But yeah. I was super impressed by it. Yeah. And then um, <laughs> Wednesday morning, you've been talking about sunrises and sunsets, uh, yeah. which we have a, amazing, right, of yeah. course. But Wednesday morning, I'm driving with the kids to school. And you know when you see those cars off on the side of the road with a hazard, you're like, oh, poor thing. Like, they must be broken down. Um, I was that guy who pulled over and turned my hazards on, 
and was like, guys, look at that sunrise. This is from God. Like, we have to acknowledge this is amazing. And that's the idea of praying without ceasing for me is just constantly trying to find God in in my day. So, And, like, as a dad, we think that, like, the things we say to our kids have the most impact, but they'll remember that moment of of sitting with you in the car presumably a lot longer than random things that we say because they're watching you engage with God. How have you, um, how has prayer been in your, like, marriage and home? Yeah, that's good. Um, before I answer that, my mm-hmm. son pulled out his phone on the sunrise and took a picture. Yeah. And they were all, like, unimpressed. But I thought, oh, he took a picture of it. He's yes. seen it. So I think there is there is modeling of that. Um, yes. Look, I, many times in, in podcast or YouTube or a marriage mm-hmm. conference you're at, you know, you walk away and somebody will say, like, the best thing you can do for your marriage is if you pray together. Mm-hmm. And that had always stuck with me, but I was never bold enough to do it as a husband and lead my family and my spouse well in that until one day my wife was like, she, she's the one who was bold and courageous, and she was like, mm-hmm. hey, come pray with me, and we prayed. Yeah. And I remember that feeling that day of going like, I wish I could have done that, and that was really simple, and that was not that hard. Why was I so afraid of it? Mm-hmm. Yet I was the guy who was homeschooled. I was afraid to ask my wife to marry me. <laughs> you know, <it's> like, <laughs> uh, But... Uh, uh, what I recognize is how close I felt in the covenant relationship between God, my spouse, my wife, Erin, and myself. And I love that. And about, uh, about a 45 days ago, I, I, I ran across this book on my wife's nightstand, and I asked permission to share this, but uh, The Power of Praying Wife. Yeah. And I thought, oh, my gosh, like, hey, what's this about? Like, tell me about this. And she was like, well, I asked a girlfriend of mine to meet with me, and Um, we decided to go through this book and pray for our husbands. And, you know, there's a number of chapters in here. Um, My wife's got some that are ear tabbed because she knows I need it. Um, (laughs) I won't tell you what they are, but (laughs) um, I just thought that's really cool and how grateful I was to know that when I leave and throughout the day, my wife is taking sections of my mind and my emotions, our relationship, my fatherhood, uh, my marriage, his, his talk, his repentance, his confession, his self-image, to know that my wife is praying that. So I went on Amazon, and I found the power of a praying husband. Let's go. So, Let's go. So now I, I've been working through this and going through this, but I think what's probably my favorite part of the entire day is we wake up, uh, it's about 5.30 in the morning. We go sit in front of a fireplace, and mm-hmm. we don't talk for 30 minutes. Um, my wife has a rule. There's no talkie before coffee. And so we just sit there, and there's probably about three or four books, and those two are part of the book. Um, but I, what I love about that is these prayers that you walk through are guided, and then they're just so enriched with Scripture. Like yeah. there's so much Scripture that you're actually praying. It's biblical truths that you're praying yeah. over your marriage. And, uh, and then um, my wife is amazing because she'll look over at me and she'll grab my hands and we'll pray whatever God's put on our heart. And that's how we start our day. And um, that's incredible. And so I, I, I think for me, you know, the practicality of it, I like simpleness. Yeah. And I think for men who probably struggle with this, um, I just encourage you, go, go buy these two books on Amazon. Cost you about 25 bucks and dive in. And uh, if you're single, go buy one of these books. There's a number of different versions of this. There's one on fear. There's one on essential faith. There's, there's a number of these. And they're really simple, and they're full of Scripture. And, uh, yeah. It's a beautiful so, thing. Two practical ways. It is, and so much of prayer is a practice. And we're going to close our service today um, with a, another guided prayer that we've been doing each week. And so we're going to do the supplication prayer today, which is just a churchy word. It means asking God for things. And so if you will turn your attention to the screen, I would encourage you to lean in and see what God has for you right here in this moment during this guided prayer.